Well, hello and welcome to worship. This is Spearfish United Methodist Church and this is the third weekend in September of 2020. Spearfish is located on the far western edge of South Dakota on the northern edge of the Black Hills and I am Pastor Scott McCurdy and it is a joy to welcome you into worship today. All through September, we're talking about the power of friendship, the power of a friend. And today what we talk about is the teaching of a friend. What does it mean for you to be taught by friends throughout your life and in turn for you to teach others? Would you bow with me? Let's begin in prayer. Lord, I want to give you thanks for this moment as we gather together far and wide around the nation, around the globe. We pray your blessing as we simply participate in this time of worship. Lord, open our hearts and our minds. Lord, open our lives to the power of a friend, the teaching of a friend. We ask it in Christ's name today. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. See you high and lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Elisha, the son of a servant, who was plowing twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elisha went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my mother and father goodbye, he said, and I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He bur burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elisha and became his attendant. Merciful God abounding in love, faithful to all who draw near you, hearing the cries of the humble in heart, showing the cross. 
wash they may cling to. Helpless I come, broken in sin, bound at the feet of your mercy. Father, forgive, may my sin be remembered no more. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, Faithful through times we have failed you. Selfish in thought and uncaring in deed. Foolish in word and ungrateful. Spirit of God, conquer our hearts with love that flows from to yield and return to the mercy of God. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, faithful to keep us from falling, guiding our ways with your fatherly heart. Each testing, God speak the day, struggles will end, hopeless will gaze on your glory. Then we will stand, overwhelmed by the mercy of to invite you to join me in prayer. Position yourself comfortably. Position yourself in a way in which you are focused and not distracted. Open your heart. Let's pray. Lord, this day, I want to lift up our friendships. In this world of pandemic, where social isolation is so powerful, where we have had to, for months, keep space between us and the other, where it is so difficult to create new friendships, so difficult to continue old friendships. Lord, we pray for those friendships, for those people in our lives who are so incredibly important. It may be our spouse, it may be our next door neighbor, it may be a family member, it, it may be one of the kids we went to grade school with or college with. Lord, it doesn't matter. We pray for those friendships, that we might look past ourselves and into the life of the other. Help us to be reaching out in kindness, especially to our friends, to strengthen those strong ties, to keep those healthy boundaries, to simply make sure that we are living and loving as friends. So Lord, we pray for those relationships when they hit difficult times. Help us to communicate with each other, Help us to love each other. Help us to have patience with each other. Lord, we pray for the good times, that there may be those moments of laughter and joy in all of this. Lord, whether our friends are the youngest or the oldest, we pray that you would add the blessing. All of this in Christ's name. Amen. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, faithful to all who draw near you, hearing the cries of the humble in heart, showing the cross they may cling to, helpless I come, broken in sin. Bound at the feet of your mercy, Father, forgive, 
May my sin be remembered no more. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, faithful through times we have failed you. Selfish in thought and uncaring in deed, foolish in Turn to the mercy of God. Merciful God, oh, abounding in love, faithful to keep us from falling, guiding our ways with your fatherly heart. Each testing, God speak the day, struggles will end, hopeless will gaze on your glory. Then we will stand, overwhelmed by the mercy of of the workers in the vineyard for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire his men at work to work in the vineyard he agreed to pay them a den denarius for the day and sent them into to his vineyard about the third hour he went and saw others standing oh, standing in the marketplace doing nothing he told them you also go and work in the, my vineyard and you will pay and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour. He did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. Then evening came and owned the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. Who were so when they those who came were hired first they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius who were when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who, have, who were hired last worked for only one hour, they said, and you, give, and you have made them equal to us and who have borne the burden of the work and the, heat of, and the heat of the day. But he answered to one of them, Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who has hired the last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be the first, and the first will be last. As we prepare our hearts and our minds, our very lives for the message this morning, I want to invite you to bow with me in a word of quietness and prayer. Amen. Elijah, one of the most powerful prophets that Israel ever had. He was a prophet, not, not an official post in any way. He, he simply was a man who understood and sensed the moving of God in his culture, in, in the life of Israel. And so he was, he was the prophet to multiple kings. Well, time went on. 
Years went on, decades went on, and he grew old. The time had come for him to prepare to die, to prepare to, prepare to leave this world. So he needed a replacement. As he looked around, I'm not sure how he identified him, I'm not sure how he knew this was the right person, but he found Elisha. Elisha, as a young man one day, was out and plowing in the fields behind a yoke of oxen. And Elijah came up behind him, took his robe, and placed it on Elisha's shoulders. And that was a moment of ordination for him, a moment of saying, you are the chosen one. I was ordained as a deacon in the United Methodist Church in 1989. Today that is known as commissioning. My road into ministry was long and hard, I mean, as, as it should be, as it is for everyone. It was a, a process of listening to God's call over the, the period of decades, hearing God's call when I was 10, again when I was 14, again when I was 16, again when I was 20, again when I was 21, again when I was 26, again, again, again. God does not let you go. And from there, it was the, the question was, all right then God, what next? I was a teacher at the time, and I chose to give up teaching and to go to seminary. Seminary was a three-year process, and that includes all of the class work and all of the discussion work and all of the mentoring work and all of the internships. And then, and then, after that ordination as deacon, I was sent out in 1990 into my first parish. All the while, while I was learning how to preach and to teach and to be present, I was going through the United Methodist process of, uh, uh, of all the paperwork and uh, all of the requirements and all of the discuss all everything that it took to become a fully ordained elder. Finally, it was in 1992, June of that year, that, that I was fully ordained. Now, here's how this works. This happened to be in Sioux Falls First United Methodist Church, and uh, they have a, a, an altar space in which they had set a kneeler in the middle of it. And those who are being ordained at annual conference come, and they kneel on, on that kneeler. They are surrounded by a small group of people. My bishop was there, and he laid his hand on me, and my district superintendent was there. But then I was allowed to pick two other pastors, who, who could come and lay hands on me, one of my dearest friends, and my father. My father was ordained as a pastor in 1956. He served for 35 years in the active ministry out, out in the Dakotas. On that day, all of us were robed it was, it's a very high worship, it's a very formal time, and all of us were, were in our robes. And so in that moment, I knelt at the altar, they all laid hands on me, they blessed me, and I stood, and they gave me my, my first stole. But as I was there, my father took his robe and while we were yet on the altar, my dad unzipped the robe, took it off, and laid it in my hands. My father is an amazing man. He is my greatest mentor. He is one of my most powerful teachers and he is one of my best friends. Today we talk about the power of a friend and the teaching of a friend. So often what we do not put into the thought process of our relationships, our close relationships, are the fact that we are each other's teachers, <clears throat> that, that it is our friends, whether they are young or old who are teaching us. 
And we, in turn, whether they are young or old, are teaching them. These friendships, be they close or far away, are incredibly powerful as we teach each other. As we teach. In this day and age, as we are in pandemic, as we live, even if there was no pandemic, as we live in a culture that is increasingly isolated, it used to be that those who were living alone stood for about 8% of our population. Today, that is almost 30%. Whoa, what? What? The isolation of our American culture with our hyper-individualism, which loves privacy and individual rights and individual space, it has a downside. It has a powerful downside. This directly affects our friendships and the power of our relationships. So inside a day and an age, when we are living in an increasingly polarized, it a polarized time, it is not easy to find who out there fits as our friends. Before social media, you know, it, we were able to cross barriers a whole lot more. But when we live in the bubble that says, uh, uh, here are the people that, that I associate with politically and spiritually and work-wise and, and, and those who are in my common situation, we live in our bubbles. And that means that it's really difficult to try to, to, to find our, our way. One of the things that is incredibly important is listening to those friends who are of a different mindset than we are. Now, in many cases, what we have devolved down into is simply what does it mean to, on email, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it may be, what does it mean to actually cross boundaries into somebody else's territory, into the life of someone who disagrees with us politically, who disagrees with us in their spiritual walk, who disagrees with us in uh, business practices, who, who is just so different from us. We have all of these differences. Now, do we have the friends that help us understand those differences? Do we have the friends who can teach us simply by being our friend? Simply by being our friend. You heard the parable today. This parable from Matthew. Now I love parables. And one of the reasons that I love them is that they are so flexible. They're not stories that actually happened. They are stories that Jesus said, yeah, well, think about this. And one of the things this means is that there is a flexibility that we can take and and give them. We can explore different interpretations. I want to give you a different interpretation. First, let me remind you, in Matthew, this is the story of the laborers in the vineyard. There was a man who had a fantastic crop coming in in his vineyard and he went down to to the, the town square where day laborers could be found and he hired all the day laborers that he could to go get this crop in. It was ready. It needed to come in now. He did that at six in the morning. Then he went back at nine in the morning and he found more workers and he said, come on, I'll give you a fair wage. Come work. Then he went back at noon and he found more. He went back at three o'clock and he found more, even though there was such a short time left in the day. And he said to each of them, come on, I'll pay you what's fair for your wages. And then he went back at five o'clock. At the end of the day, he decided to start with those who had come last and he paid them an entire day's wage. There were no complaints on their end. They thought this was great. Meanwhile, the people at the end of the line, the one who had been working the hardest and the longest, they began clicking this together and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, how much are we going to get paid? Well, you know how the parable went. Everybody got paid the same. And that was not a happy thing for those who had been working 
since early in the morning. And as they started complaining about it, the owner of the vineyard said, it's my choice. Are you gonna complain about my generosity? This is what I choose. And those who are first shall be last, and those who are last shall be first. Now, I want to take that parable, and I simply want to switch it. And let's talk about you. Here is another form of that parable. You began to grow up. You, were, you started as a child. Good thing. And when you were a child, you entered elementary school, and in elementary school, within the first week, you began to make a new friend. And that friend would teach you about what it meant to be in first grade and second grade and third grade, and you would talk about the teachers, and you would talk about the other kids, and you would talk about how to do whatever needed to be done, and you learned from each other as you imitated, and then you grew up. And as you grew for a few years, you became a teenager. And in your teenage years, you had new friends. And you, you were together and you talked and you learned and you grew. And you grew up. And you graduated from high school and maybe you went to college or maybe you went to tech school or maybe you went to work. But whatever that new environment was, you in your late teens, early 20s began to make new friends and your learning curve was so steep. And so you learned and your friends taught you, this is how you work. This is how you play. Here are the things that we can do, you taught. And you continued to grow. A decade and a half later, you were in your 30s and you lived in a different place and your job was different. Whether it was the same job or a different job, it was still different in how you did it. And uh, as you did this, you had new friends. And your friends helped you, taught you, guided you, advised you. All that time that we spend on the phone talking with our friends, all that time that we email, all that time on Facebook, all that time that we Twitter with each other, we're constantly learning and growing from our friends. And then you grew. And you grew. And maybe you had kids, or maybe you didn't. And uh, maybe you stayed in the same job, and maybe you didn't. Maybe you stayed in the same town, or maybe you didn't. And you grew into your 50s and into your 60s, and the time came for you to retire. And even when you're retiring, you still have to learn a whole new skill set. And so you learned by talking with your friends and growing. And finally, in your 80s, it was time to slow down. Or maybe you didn't. But you learned what it meant to be an octogenarian. You learned to, be, to know what it meant to live in your 80s. How did you do that? By talking to friends. Now you're seeing the parallel to this, to this parable. There were some friends in your life who came first. And some of those friends stayed your friends for your entire life. And some of your friends you just made, even late in life. But the power of a friend is in the teaching of a friend. At every step in life, whether it was someone who was there at the very beginning of your friendships or at the very end, there is a power in the friendships. And the first will be last, and the last will be first. As we learn and as we grow, we learn what it means to be that friend. We learn what it means to have that friend. We learn what it means to live in friendship. Now, sometimes that can be toxic. Sometimes it's really healthy and really strong and really good, and sometimes friendships turn sour and they turn toxic, especially in this day and age of social media 
So the question then becomes, how do you maintain healthy friendships? It's all about communication, open communication. It's all about boundaries. Here are my personal boundaries. And even with our good friends, those boundaries have to be honored. Now what happens when you wind up living in a bubble? A bubble that is toxic. It means that, that we either have to figure out ways to keep our friendships proactive and positive, or we need to find the boundaries that allow us to not be in those friendships, or at least not as close to those friendships anymore. One of the things that is so important is absolutely reflecting the love of Christ into our relationships. Ironically, what this means is that our friendships may not look like friendships. When we get into arguments, when we get into the toxic portions of them, how is it that we hold our boundaries and to say, no, 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 I can love you in this. And sometimes loving our friends in this means that we have to back up and put some distance between us. Living in each other's back pockets the way you used to isn't the way it goes all the way through life. And so we learn, we learn, we learn. Elijah came up behind Elisha and put that robe over him. And in that, that friendship, it was not just friendship, it was mentorship. It was a mentoring that said, let me teach you, let me help you grow, let me help you be who you need to be. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to, to take into consideration how is it that we help each other, love each other, strengthen each other, teach each other? We can teach our friends what mutual respect looks like. We can teach our friends what the joy of life can be about. But we can only teach our friends so much because their personality is their personality and our personality is our personality and we change. Years ago, I went up to the hospital in Bismarck. I had a parishioner who had fallen in her apartment and uh, uh, had fractured her pelvis. And so I went all the way up onto the seventh floor where she was in rehab. And when I walked into the door, Mrs. Pulver was there in her bed. There was her daughter. There was her granddaughter. And there, on the bed with her, was her great-granddaughter. Her great-granddaughter was 16 years old. Marion Pulver, at that moment, was 104 years old. <laughs> And those two, her great-granddaughter, was painting her fingernails fire engine red. And Mrs. Pulver, at this moment in time, at 104, had, had lost all of the hair on her head, so she always wore a beautiful, dignified wig. Except when she was in private moments like this, and, and she was very comfortable being without it. Well, the nurse came in and said, Mrs. Pulver, it is time to go downstairs. It is time for some rehab on that lovely pelvis and hip of yours. And she said, oh, do I have to? She said, I don't mind the exercises so much, but oh my goodness, my wig is so hot. It is just so uncomfortable. And her great-granddaughter said, Grandma, I think that you should just wear my hat. And she took off this super cute little Tommy Hilfiger hat and <laughs> put it on her grandma. And her grandma thought this was just the best thing ever. And so they, they got in the wheelchair and here is this 104 year old woman with fire engine red fingernails and a Tommy Hilfiger hat and down the hall they went. That moment taught me so much about what the power of friendship means. What I just witnessed what I just witnessed was a friendship that had 90 years between it. What I just witnessed was the teaching as she was teaching her great-granddaughter and talking, 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 but her great-granddaughter was teaching her. And they were teaching each other about what it meant to live within boundaries and how you can adjust those boundaries. You don't have to wear your wig. You can wear a Tommy Hilfiger hat. 
What does it mean to be in that moment? This is what we do. We teach each other about what it means to be in friendship. This week, I want to invite you to be thinking about your friendships. How is it that you remember and treasure those that are really important to you? How do you create new friendships? How are you reaching out to nurture them? Not just letting them happen, but nurturing them and helping them happen. How do you strengthen family and the friendships that exist there? How do you create the boundaries and hold them? I want you to be thinking about these. As Elijah put the robe around Elisha, as we remember the parable that says the first shall be last and the last shall be first, and they come, all of these friends come at different points in our lives. May it be that you treasure and create those friendships in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would you pray with me? Lord, take our friendships and infuse yourself into them that we might truly learn what friendship means and how it works. Lord, help us to treasure, help us to create, Help us to be a friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive this blessing. May you go now as a people who have been named by God and claimed by God, this God who is your friend. And as you go into the world to become a friend, to be a friend, to share as a friend, may you go in the name of God who is our creator, Jesus Christ who is our savior, the Holy Spirit who is our guide. And as you go, may it always be in God's peace. Go. Go.